Well, I'm sure that we can all agree that we're living in very disturbing times, deeply troubling times. Over the past few weeks, we've seen the greatest assembly of military force since the time of the Second World War. What, what is taking place in the world right now is absolutely unprecedented in modern times because an independent, sovereign, democratic nation is in the process of being invaded and frankly destroyed by an autocratic Russia. Vladimir Putin has acted and the rest of the world it seems has stood by and watched for fear of getting involved in an escalating conflict and perhaps provoking a third world war. Of course we know that there were uh, considerable attempts at diplomacy um, in order to try to avert, avert what everybody apart from Mr Putin uh, is saying would be a catastrophe not just for Ukraine but also for Russia and possibly the whole world and of course all to no avail. Putin pressed on with a full-scale invasion of another sovereign country and of course his words were chilling were they not. <clears throat> now the United Kingdom, the US and countries of the European Union unanimously condemned Vladimir Putin's actions and of course they've imposed the severest economic sanctions upon Russia, the severest sanctions that the world has ever seen. And we know from the news that these sanctions are already having an impact upon Russia's economy and with, with fears of a run on the Russian banks. And how has Mr Putin responded? Well, he's just increased the rhetoric by announcing that he's placed Russia's nuclear weapons on standby. So, rightly so, there is real concern, downright fear in the world right now. Would this man be foolish enough to detonate a nuclear bomb and to risk uncontrollable escalation of the conflict? Would he really do that? And, of course, we must never forget that at the heart of all this, there is the terrible suffering that is being inflicted upon many thousands of people that have been caught up in the conflict through no fault of their own and have had to flee from their homes as refugees. And really, our, our hearts go out to these people. It's absolutely heartbreaking to see what is happening in that country at the moment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm speaking to you tonight on behalf of the Christadelphians, and we believe that actually, contrary to what's happening in the news at the moment, we have good news to share. Because we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and that it is very relevant to the political situation that we are seeing right now in the world. And I hope to show you tonight that actually the inexorable rise of Russia to a, a position of power and influence that we're seeing right now was actually predicted in the Bible thousands of years ago. But we also believe that the Bible teaches us that Russia's aggression on the world stage will serve as merely a prelude to the greatest event that the world has ever seen. And that is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment on the earth of the kingdom of God, a kingdom of righteousness and peace that will last forever. And in his word, the Bible, God invites 
you and me, to inherit the kingdom and to live forever in a world at peace. So this is what we believe the message of the Bible is for you and me. Now, I want to explain, explain that as Christadelphians, we take no political stance. So we have no political affiliation, either with Ukraine or with Russia or with any other country. We are simply trying to understand world events through the lens of what the Bible says. Because, you see, Mr. Putin might believe that he is in control of world events. But, ladies and gentlemen, he most certainly is not. Because, you see, there is one much greater than him who is working out his purpose with the earth. And that one is God. And evil will not be allowed to prevail. Just have a look at these words that we find in one of the other Old Testament prophets, the prophecy of Daniel. And this is what it says there. It says, This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. So this is what the Bible says. So you see, contrary to what Mr. Putin believes, God is firmly in control of world events. And just look at these words from another prophet, the prophecy of Amos. It says, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. So you see, God tells us here that he reveals his secrets in advance through his servants, the prophets. And, and the wonderful thing for you and me is that we have those remarkable prophecies written down for us in the pages of the Bible. And hopefully, by the time we finish tonight, you will be able to see that this really is the case, that God has re revealed his purpose to us in advance in his word, the Bible. But first of all, though, I think it would be a good idea for us to have just a broad idea of some key Ukrainian history so that we can try, if possible, to, to make sense of what's been happening in the last few days. And we need to understand that the history between Russia and Ukraine is complicated. So let me just outline one or two relevant facts. Historically, Russia, Ukraine and Belarus all draw their lineage from a Slavic people known as the Kievan Rus. And they're known as the Kievan Rus because originally Kiev was the capital city, the principal city. Uh, and this is why, of course, Mr. Putin is so interested in the city of Kiev. And Interestingly, in about 900 AD, the Kievan Rus were ruled over by this gentleman, Grand Prince Vladimir. So he was the ruler of the Kievan Rus in AD 900. And I'm sure it's not escaped your attention that today the leaders of Russia and Ukraine share the same name. Now, actually, for many centuries, Ukraine was under Russian control. And, and, of course, this is one of the reasons why Putin has recently said that he doesn't believe that Ukraine has a right to exist as a separate country. And he's made no secret of the fact that he views Ukraine very much as part of Russia, 
In fact, in 2021, last year, he wrote a big long essay entitled On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And in this essay, he rather ominously questioned the legitimacy of Ukraine's borders and he argued that Ukraine occupies historically Russian lands and he stated very matter-of-factly that Russia was robbed. So that's where Mr Putin's coming from. Now, of course, in the 20th century, Russia and Ukraine were both part of the Soviet Union. And actually, at the time, Ukraine was the second most powerful of the Soviet republics. And in fact, during the Cold War, Ukraine was actually the arch rival of the United States. And it, and it was home to most of the Soviet Union's nuclear weapons. But of course, we know what happened. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed and Ukraine at that time became independent. And then in 1994, the Budapest Agreement was signed in which Ukraine pledged to give all the nuclear weapons back to Russia in exchange for Russia's agreement to respect Ukraine's sovereignty as an independent country. So that was the Budapest Agreement, 1994. Coming forward now, 2013, the president of Ukraine was this man, Viktor Yanukovych. And he was very much pro-Russian. In fact, he was really nothing more than a, a Russian puppet. But it, he was actually a very weak politician. And he rather foolishly uh, rejected a proposed trade deal with the EU. And this rejection provoked protests on the streets of Kiev. And as a result, the government in Ukraine was eventually toppled and Yanukovych had to flee back to Russia. And in his place, a pro-Western government was elected. And of course, that did not go down well in Russia. After all, they just lost their puppet ruler in Ukraine. And so Russia retaliated the following year in 2014 by annexing the Crimean Peninsula. And of course, since then, uh, political interest has moved really to the east part of Ukraine, the area known as the Donbass. And what's happened is that Russian-backed Russian separatists began to take territory in the east, in the Donbass, and when Ukraine tried to flush out the rebels, the Russian military stepped in, and then a series of talks followed, resulting in what's known as the Minsk Agreement in 2014. And the Minsk Agreement proposed three things. Firstly, an immediate ceasefire between Russia and Ukraine. Secondly, Russian military withdrawal. And thirdly, elections in the rebel-held areas of the Donbass. Now, the point is that the Minsk Agreement was never fully implemented. And, and this really is the background to the crisis that's happening right now. There has been hostility between Russia and eastern Ukraine for the past eight years or so, and thousands of lives have already been lost. So the current situation is this, that actually Ukraine is divided into east and west, really. There's the east, the Donbass, which is closer to Russia, and then there's the west part of Ukraine, which is more political, more European in its political affiliations. But the question is, what does Vladimir Putin really want? What is he trying to achieve? Well, he says 
that he believes Russia and Ukraine are one people. And so he's trying to build, bring the whole of Ukraine back into the fold, so to speak, regardless, it would seem, of the wishes of the Ukrainian people. And of course, Putin absolutely resents the fact that Ukraine has shifted its allegiance to the West. And he wants NATO to stop expanding towards Russia's borders. Ukraine, of course, is not currently part of NATO, and he wants <coughs> NATO's request to join NATO to be absolutely ruled out. In fact, he wants all former Soviet territories to be permanently excluded from NATO. And he also wants to create a land corridor to the Crimea from Russia. Crimea, of course, is a peninsula. And up until the past few days, the only connection between Crimea and Russia was via this bridge. So Putin wants to create a land connection between Russia and the Crimea. Now this map, which was taken just two days ago, three days ago, shows that the Russian forces have almost achieved that objective. The strategic city of Mariupol has been under siege for days now and there is a growing sense of foreboding that what is happening in that city will amount to uh, an absolute humanitarian catastrophe. So that's what's happening. And of course, Crimea is particularly important to Putin for this reason, because it represents his access to the Black Sea and thence onwards to the Mediterranean. And we know that Russia is currently amassing a large number of ships so that she can exert her influence all over the world. So that's where we are today. As we said, there's a, there's a lot of history behind what is currently happening in Ukraine. And, and in some respects, Putin believes that he is trying to put right what he sees as the wrongs of the past. But be in no illusion, ladies and gentlemen, that Russia's activity in Ukraine is by no means the end of Russia's ambitions. Mr. Putin has much grander plans in mind than simply the occupation of Ukraine. And this is what we're going to see tonight in the rest of our time together. But we're also going to see that those plans are destined to fail, ultimately. But in truth, we're not really interested in trying to look at things from Mr. Putin's perspective, or from anybody else's for that matter. What we want to see is what the Bible has to say to us, because as we said at the beginning, as Christadelphians, we believe that the Bible is the inspired, infallible word of God, and that in his word, God has important things to say to us, not just about what's happening in the world right now, but about God's ultimate plan for the whole world. So with that in mind, I'd like us to have a look now at that chapter that John read for us at the beginning, this remarkable prophecy that we find in Ezekiel chapter 38. And let's just put a bit of background in our minds first. Who was Ezekiel? When did he live? Well, he was a Jew, and he actually lived in exile in Babylon. Because what had happened was that the Jewish kingdom had recently been invaded and laid waste by the Babylonians. And many of the Jews had been taken captive into Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And Ezekiel was one of those Jewish 
captives. And all this happened about 600 years before the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's when Ezekiel lived, and there he was in exile in Babylon. Now, in this prophecy, which was given whilst he was in Babylon, Ezekiel spoke about another, a future invasion of the land of Israel. Not just this time by one king, but by a whole confederacy of nations described in the first six verses of Ezekiel chapter 38. And this confederacy would come from the north. And we'll have a look at those nations and who they might be later on tonight. But first of all, I want us to notice very carefully exactly when this invasion of the land of Israel is said to take place. And, and this is what we're going to focus on for the first part of tonight. Because you see, Ezekiel tells us exactly when this invasion will take place. It's in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 8. He says, After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them, and thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army, and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land, it shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So you see, Ezekiel tells us here, twice, that this prophecy would meet its fulfilment in the latter years, or the latter days, he says. So it wasn't for Ezekiel's days. It was for a time far off into the future called the latter days. Now friends, we believe that we are living in those latter days. This prophecy has to do with the days in which we are living. Now how can we be so sure about that? How can we be so confident that we are living in those latter days. <clears throat> well, I want you to notice how Israel is described in this chapter. At the time when this invasion of the land of Israel takes place in the latter days, this is how Israel is described. Verse 8, it's described as being brought back <coughs> from the sword gathered out of many people, brought forth out of the nations, dwelling safely. Verse 12 says, describes them as the desolate places now inhabited. <coughs> the people gathered out of the nations, having gotten cattle and goods. And verse 13 tells us that they have got, gotten silver and gold. They're rich and prosperous. So you see, Ezekiel is describing a nation of Israel that has been restored to the land. The people have been gathered out of the nations and the nation has become wealthy. Now just think about that really carefully. Because you see, that is an exact description of the state of Israel that we see in the world today. In fact, it only fits the nation of Israel that exists today. You see, we, we sometimes forget that until comparatively recent years, there was no such thing as the state of Israel because Israel has always been there during our lifetimes. 
and, and we're used to seeing pictures like this on the news. So we sometimes assume that that's how it's always been. But that's not the case. You see, at the time of Ezekiel, the Jews were in exile in Babylon and they remained in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. And then the, the Jewish exiles were allowed to go back to their land as a result of a decree that was issued by this man, Cyrus the Great. So that was about 500 years before the time of Christ. But although the exiles went back to the land, the nation was never restored to the greatness that it had enjoyed previously during the reigns of kings like King Solomon or King David. So it never was restored to its previous greatness. And then when the Roman Empire emerged on the world scene, the nation of Israel was really just a, a small province of that vast empire. There it is on the map. And it was to this struggling little nation that the Lord Jesus Christ eventually came. And of course we know what happened to Jesus. He was ultimately crucified at the hands of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. And then 40 years later, after the crucifixion of Jesus, the Roman armies came down and they completely destroyed the nation of Israel. The city of Jerusalem was besieged in AD 70. And, and when it fell, the Jews were carried off into the four corners of the Roman Empire. They were taken off into captivity. And here's a, an artist's impression of the siege and the destruction of Jerusalem that took place in AD 70. And actually, if you go to Jerusalem today, you can still see evidence of the destruction of that city that was brought about by the Romans in AD 70. And even the name of Jerusalem was removed from the map in the time of the Roman Empire. And that's how it was for nearly 1900 years. Israel as a nation just did not exist. But then you see, 74 years ago, in 1948, something quite remarkable happened. Because on the 14th of May, 1948, the State of Israel was declared. And here's a, a photograph, a famous photograph of the first Israeli Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, declaring the independence of the State of Israel. And that's the front page of the Palestine Post for that day. State of Israel is born. Now how remarkable is that? That after nearly 2,000 years, the State of Israel came into existence once again. And then of course in 1967, the Six Day War broke out. And the outcome of that was that actually Israel expanded her territory and they took control of the city of Jerusalem for the first time since AD 70. And then since 1967, we know that there have been frequent conflicts with the surrounding Arab nations, especially with the Palestinians. But the Jewish nation is still there against all the odds uh, and amidst considerable opposition from her neighbours. Israel hasn't just survived, it's thrived. And especially, of course, in recent years with the development of IT and the discovery of vast reserves of natural gas and oil off the coast, Israel has become a wealthy nation. 
So, in fact, when we think about it, this event that we're thinking about in Ezekiel chapter 38 could have been fulfilled at no other time in history other than the present day. Because, of course, for Israel to be invaded by this great northern confederacy of nations, there obviously must be a nation of Israel to invade. And that has only been the case in the last 74 years, since 1948. Now, this is not the only prophecy in the Bible that talks about the regathering of the Jews to their land. Far from it. You see, the Bible explains to us that God has a purpose with the Jews. And he has declared in his word, the Bible, that the day would come in the latter days when they would be regathered to their land. Let me just show you a few examples. Jeremiah chapter 31. God says, Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. Another one from the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 36. God says, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. One more from the prophecy of Hosea chapter 3. It says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king and without a prince and without a sacrifice and without an image and without an ephod and without teraphim, afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Now that one is particularly interesting because it says there that for many years Israel would have no king. In fact, the last king of Israel was removed from the throne by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, in the days of the prophet Ezekiel. That was the last king of Israel. He says there will be no sacrifice and no priesthood too. And that's what happened. Israel's system of religious worship was dismantled by Nebuchadnezzar when he came down and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. But you notice, in the latter days, says Hosea, and again notice that phrase, in the latter days, he says they will return to God. And ultimately, that means that they will turn to God in faith. Now, we're not there yet, because for the most part, the Jews don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't accept that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But the point is that they are back in the land, just like these prophecies said. So, friends, what we can say is that these are the reasons why we believe that we are living in the latter days, because Israel is back in the land, and they are thriving, just like Ezekiel said. They've become wealthy. So the revival of the state of Israel in comparatively modern times is, we believe, quite a remarkable sign of the times. Let's make no mistake about that. Now let's just stop and think about the significance of what we've seen before we move on. Because you see, God said nearly 3,000 years ago through his prophets that his people would be preserved and one day they would go back to the land and become prosperous and we today have seen that being fulfilled 
So what does that tell us about the Bible? Well, surely it tells us this, that we can trust what the Bible says. And the logical conclusion has to be that the Bible really is what it claims to be. It's the word of God. God is speaking to us through his word and we need to listen to what God is saying to us. Now that's all very well, I hear you say, but what has that got to do with the current crisis in Ukraine? And that's a fair question. But you see, the, the message from Ezekiel chapter 38 is that although Israel is back in their land, just as God said would happen, and although they've become wealthy, just as God said they would be, there are unfortunately difficult days ahead for Israel. Because you see, this chapter is describing a future devastating invasion of the land of Israel by a group of nations that are described in the first few verses of Ezekiel chapter 38. And we're going to take a break now, and then we shall see if we can try and identify who these nations are that are going to launch this offensive against the nation of Israel. And mo most important of all, how that terrible event is ultimately going to lead to the establishment of the kingdom of God on the earth. Thank you. 